Yeah, the reason you can't hear it is because it's not HDMI today. And so uh, it's on RGB. For some reason, HDMI doesn't work. So you can only hear my uh, computer. So uh, we'll use this to, to roll in easily to the, the full semester now that we're past the um, past Labor Day. Labor Day is usually the beginning of the second week rather than the beginning of the first week of classes. So it's unusual in, in that regard here. Uh, so. Ready? so this is uh, just a, a video to, to get us warmed up. Um, hopefully you looked online at the, uh, the materials that are uh, available for 2.1 2 or 2 colon 1, which was uh, Monday's uh, class while you were enjoying yourself, doing whatever you were doing on, on Monday. Um, and so, uh, if you don't have Canvas set up for, uh, to receive email alerts, you should have got two email alerts at the end of the week announcements. One basically saying what we've done this week, uh, and then one on midnight uh, Saturday morning, which basically gives the deliverables for the second week. And, and that happens every, every week. So that's a, a standard thing for us. And so, that just would have said, we're in class this week except for Labor Day. Labor Day stuff's online. Extra credit if you want to do it. You should do it uh, because you're responsible for the material anyway. Um, and it's the beginning of our material that now talks about uh, not fluid properties, which was really the first week in the introduction, but now uh, fluid pressures both at a point and next week on surfaces. And so the uh, material for Monday, two colon one, was basically talking about that. Uh, and so for this week, we'll talk about uh, fluid pressures both at a point and changing them in, in location, being able to integrate them in some way. So, and then next week, we'll talk about fluid pressures on surfaces, on structures, for instance, on the backs of dams, um, to be able to understand exactly what's going on how to be able to look at the stability of structures, for instance, whether sea walls will stand up, uh, whether dams will collapse, uh, and, and other features, all for fluid statics, static fluids. And static fluid is a fluid which is uh, not circulating. So for our definition and our purpose, fluid would be uh, something in a, a beaker that I would have, and I'd be able to move it across the room at some velocity or I could accelerate it across the room at some acceleration, and that would still be fluid statics, even though those, those fluids were really in the big reference frame uh, of this classroom, were actually moving and accelerating. And so the equations that we uh, looked at on, um, in 2.1 were to allow us to be able to understand that problem. So fluid in static, pressures in static fluids and how they change in space and how they change depending on whether they are um, liquids or gases, both, both are fluids. And this is just to, to warm us, to get us in. I guess we're at the, the witching hour now, and so we can get rolling. But of course, a balloon, which in this case is carrying this uh, payload aloft to get a picture of the Bay Area before ultimately the balloon popping and the package drifting back to, uh, to ground. Um, is something that relies on um, a density contrast between the density of the fluid inside the balloon and the density of the fluid outside the balloon. And so uh, that is controlled also by the, the uh, behavior that we're seeking to understand in this, this portion. So I will stop that now. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Uh, I guess in the news, of course, all kinds of strange things going on, but the um, the one fluid mechanics thing that's in the news, of course, which relies in some respects on some of the things that we've talked about already uh, in 2.1, and that is uh, the behavior of hurricanes, both things like storm surge. So um, the Bahamas, apparently, elevation of the land there is something like uh, 18 feet. The storm surge was supposed to be 20 feet, three me six meters. And so that is not a, a particularly good mix. And of course, we can examine 
storm surge based on what we understand about hurricanes, and maybe we'll do that as we uh, finish recounting exactly what we've, we've done so far. So the plan today is, uh, is basically to, to look at the material that we've uh, touched on before. If you look at, uh, hopefully you've all done this. Oh, that's not the one. Uh, yeah, I guess that is the one, right? So one way to do this is for me to put this on um, 30 speed. So 60 minutes should run in two minutes. And so the whole idea of uh, what we talked about in 2.1 was the idea of, of fluids and how pressures change within fluids both those that accelerate and those that uh, are static, um, making the case that they have different properties. But most importantly, if you, for the example of going up Everest, the idea is you could take a bucket of air, so long as that bucket has no weight to the bucket itself, and you could stack many buckets on top of each other to be able to figure out exactly what the weight you have to carry above them is. And you can do that with a single bucket if you think that density of that fluid is constant, or you can do it with multiple buckets if you think the density of that fluid will change as a function of the buckets that are sitting on top of it. And so the easiest way to do that in a comprehensive way is by differential calculus. And the bucket doesn't have to be a bucket, but it can be a little differential cube. And if you look at those same forces that are applied on stacking these differential cubes on top of each other, you end up with the governing equations that we'll use in, in this class for fluid statics. It's nothing more than that. So it's calculus, but it's just by looking at small changes in the behavior of those buckets as you shrink them down, each bucket down to an infinitesimally small uh, size. And so out of that come a variety of different expressions, which we'll recap today, uh, but allow us to be able to make the same calculations as with multiple buckets, but by using um, differential calculus, which is more uh, universally applicable to the, the systems that we're dealing with. So that's what we're attempting to, to do today. And so you should have looked at this. Uh, if not, then it's not bad quality. I think on YouTube, you can certainly run it at double speed. I don't think you can run it at 30 speed. Uh, of course, when you run it at 30 speed, you have to guess what the narrative is because the, the, the narrative doesn't come through. But we'll basically recap the expressions that we talked about uh, on Two, one. Okay. So I will get rid of this and we will bring that up. I don't know what you did on Monday and Sunday. I went to the races in uh, Lock Haven. Every uh, Labor Day they have a regatta with tiger planes uh, on the river. The river is one that got flooded out in 72 by Hurricane Agnes uh, before I lived here and certainly before most of you, almost all of you were born, I think. Um, and uh, there's a now a retaining wall with bleachers on it, which protects the, the city of Lockhaven from future, future floods. All right, so this is what we will deal with today. So um, I can kill this off, and I can maybe get this going here. So the points that we went through last time, uh, would have been uh, to derive these expressions here. I'll, I'll just write them out just because they're expressions that we will use today. I guess everything is on the screen today. HDMI is not working, but RGB is. So uh, if you like the st static equations. <coughs> Writing's not very good yet. So what we did was we resolved in the z direction. I guess we should make the case first that we define a coordinate system, and it's important to say exactly what that coordinate system is. It's a right-handed coordinate system. Right-handed because it's the thumb, first and second fingers, uh, x, y, and z. z for us will always be positive upwards. And if that's the case, then um, the expressions we have are a change in pressure with elevation in the z direction, minus uh, density of the fluid times gravity 
um, minus density times acceleration in the z direction is equal to zero. Uh, in the y direction, I'm doing them kind of backwards. You might think that we do the x, y, z. Uh, the change in pressure in the y direction minus zero, because gravity doesn't act in the y direction, minus whatever acceleration we give to the fluid in the y direction is equal to zero. And in the x direction, just by permuting these uh, symbols, the change in pressure in x, there's a minus sign in front of each of these. Again, there is no gravity that acts in the horizontal direction, minus the density of the fluid times the acceleration in the x direction is equal to zero. So those are interesting equations in that they come directly from uh, F minus MA equals zero. That's basically the expression that we're representing. That's why uh, dynamics is an important prerequisite for this class, just for that one equation. And it makes the case that we can define the behaviors of the system in terms of these different variables. So for uh, this week and also next week, we won't talk about accelerations. And so these are kind of the general expressions that we'll deal with. Actually, from this expression here, we'll also derive uh, Bernoulli's equation, which is a dynamic equation. But if we take the fact that uh, in our beaker that I'm walking across the room with, uh, it's not accelerating. So in other words, it could be moving at a constant velocity, as I am. I'm not accelerating. If it's accelerating, then you know what acceleration is. The, the velocity is changing with time. Moving at constant velocity, then if the acceleration are zero for each of these, then we get three simpler expressions coming out of it. The first is that um, from the first equation is that the change in pressure with elevation is equal to minus density times gravity, which is same as the, the unit weight of the fluid. And that's the fluid pressure that we feel as we go up or down. Um, and, you know, well, we did some examples in the, the video last time. If you look at the um, elevation versus pressure changes that you get in a liquid, then we know that they look something like that. If you look uh, in a gas above the liquid, then we know that they'll look like that. We'll come back to that in a second later. So this expression is always true. And it really just means that this change, I guess I can make it a bit larger, this change in pressure occurs with a change in elevation. It's nothing more than that. And so from this, you could also surmise that the slope of this line, if you extend it, is going to be equal to the unit weight of the fluid and one. That's really just what that expression means. It means as you go down in a fluid, you feel a change in pressure, and that pressure changes according to the depth that you are. So it relies on the stuff above you. That's why when we're looking at Everest, we can take a whole bunch of buckets that represent the atmosphere all the way to the stratosphere where there's no pressure at all. And it's that weight that we're carrying here. Everything around us is at the same pressure, so we don't notice it. And that's why the pressure, atmospheric pressure is one bar or one atmosphere or 101.3 uh, kPa. So that's one expression that comes out of it. The other expression that comes out of it is from these two other equations, and that is that since these are both equal to zero, then um, this also is true. dP dy is equal to dP dx which is equal to zero. This is a P, not a rho. Uh, so they start looking the same. So, And so we've also used that 
in what we've done before. And that is, if you recall, that when we did looked at um, capillary behaviors in tubes and capillary rise, what we did was we said that as you go from this point here to this point here, if you can get horizontally between two points in a connected path, then uh, in this particular case, the, there should be no change in pressure as you go from location to location. And so if you go horizontally between these two locations, this is at atmospheric pressure and this is at atmospheric pressure. So that means we could cut the bottom off the fluid and do the free body diagram for holding the fluid up by um, these parts here. And that gave us our expression to define capillary behavior. So we've used that already. The other place where I guess you could use that is in understanding uh, storm surges. Right? So we know that if you have a hurricane um, that may be in the center of the hurricane, it is something like 900 millibars. And at the edge of a hurricane, normal atmospheric pressure is something like 1,000 millibars. A bar is just one atmosphere, or 100, roughly 100 kilopascals. So the same idea, if you go horizontally from this point to this point, you have to be at the same pressure. But that can't be the case if it's here 900 millibars in the atmosphere at 10,000 feet or whatever, and 1,000 here, so there's differential. And so the reason for that is that a storm surge, you could examine the fact that you have a storm surge, and a storm surge would be something that would give you, you could make the case that the storm surge is due to the fact that you have this extra height of fluid that is here. And so this height of fluid has to be equal to 100 millibars, right? Because you have 900 acting here, you want 1,000 acting here because they're on the same line. And so there have to be 100 millibars of pressure in here. So 100 millibars is, uh, so 100 uh, kPa is equal to uh, one bar. A millibar is a thousand bar, a thousandth of a bar. So 100 millibars is 0.1 of a, a bar. So 0.1 of a bar is 10 kPa. I guess I'm running off here for this, I guess. Oh, that doesn't help very much. I'm running off the page anyway, so it doesn't matter. And so 10 kilopascals is actually one meter of water, as we'll talk about today. So clearly, if... Um, Bermuda or Barbados? The Bahamas. Bermuda, Barbados, and Bahamas. They're all the same to me, but they're not, obviously. So if the storm surge is 20 feet, which is 6 meters, then clearly this is a normal uh, low, maybe high 800 millibars for the center of a hurricane, then the storm surge can't be merely due to the fact that it's a reduced pressure in the middle. You get a meter of it from it, but you can't get 6 meters. So the other 6 meters has to come from the fact that Hurricanes swirl. The other fluid mechanical part of that is that as you have high winds going across the ocean, they kind of bulldoze the ocean by dragging on it with vis viscosity, just as we talk about viscous behavior on, on in 1.3. And it's that that pushes it up on the shore, which causes it to pile up like a, like a bulldozer. And so you can at least examine uh, the behavior of that. So the, the important points that come out of this are the ones that are written here. Um, if the accelerations are zero, then this is correct, and this is correct. Those are the ones that we've just examined. The other feature that we have to be able to look at is that how we get pressures at a location. And so the easiest way to do that is to, what am I going to do? I'm going to do this. I'm going to take this. And so if we want to be able to get pressures at a location, well, we've made the case that pressures at a point 
aren't independent of the other pressures around it. They rely on the, the fluid above us. And so if you want to do that, at least in the vertical direction, then we can take this expression, which is dp dz is equal to minus unit weight. And we can write it out as change in pressure is equal to minus unit weight multiplied by dz. I'll write it as a full diff derivative. I can do this. I'll write it as a, not a, a partial, but a full derivative. We can do the integration. We can look at the geometry that we have, which is z being vertically upwards. We can look at uh, the pressure distribution as we have as we go down. This is pressure. And uh, we could also do it. That's, it's easier, I think, if we do it above this axis. So in other words, if you write z0 and z1, this would be P0 and P1. And so we would just integrate these between those two limits. And we have two cases that we can worry about. The first is for a liquid, where density is constant. And so we can legitimately take this unit weight, which is rho g, outside the integration. And we just do the integration. And we end up with p1 minus p0 is equal to minus unit weight c1 minus c0. And so that's the same as pressure at location 1 is equal to the pressure at some reference location minus the unit weight times the difference in these elevations. And the only thing to realize is that uh, since Z1 is bigger than Z0 in our system going upwards, then <clears throat> this is negative. And so we think of this as a height. is equal to minus delta Z. And so if, if we define this term here as minus H, then we end up with the pressure at 1 is equal to the pressure at 0 plus unit weight times H. And H is now defined going downwards. It's just the easiest, easy way to write it. So that's a, a standard expression that we that will use. And finally, uh, the converse to that is if the fluid is not a liquid but is a gas, then we know that we can use the ideal gas law where pressure is equal to density times RT. And correspondingly, density is equal to pressure divided by RT. And now no longer is density a constant. No longer can it be taken outside the integration. And we have to do the integration with it in there. And we did that last time, so I won't go through it again. But you can get an expression for that, which looks like this here which allows you to accommodate the fact that the pressure, the density is changing. So now, basically, that's saying that all the buckets that exist above us, the bucket right here has a lot of weight on top of it. Pressure compresses it, and therefore it's quite dense. But the one above it doesn't have quite so much weight on it, so it's not quite so dense. And as you go further up, the pressure gets less and less because the density gets less and less. And so if you look at how um, you would classify behaviors in this particular system here, then I suppose this um, density that you have here, <coughs> pardon me, certainly isn't um, straight, right? It bends. And it should asymptote as you go further up. And I can't draw that very well, but I'll try drawing it. 
you would asymptote to a vertical line. And the important thing about that vertical line is that that line would be a pressure, absolute pressure of zero, right? Out of space. So there's no pressure in space because there's no atmosphere above it. All the, as you go up in the atmosphere, all the air that exists on the planet, <clears throat> all the nitrogen and oxygen which makes up the, the air we breathe, is all below you as you get up to the outer part of the atmosphere. And so we can expect that the, the, the behavior we have as we go up through the system is like this. And so that actually looks a bit like what we dealt with <clears throat> in this um, balloon that's rising. And the reason that the balloon rises, of course, I'm going to get rid of some of this. What am I going to get rid of? Get rid of this. If, for instance, it's probably easier to think about it for a submarine. <clears throat> if you think about how density would change if you have a liquid like water, um, I suppose you, we could think about a less dense liquid, one of which would be alcohol, for instance. So you could think about <clears throat> filling up a weightless submarine with alcohol, just or fill up a buoy with alcohol. And if you go to any particular depth that you care to choose and look at what that little system would look like. So this is your balloon that sits here. If you look at the pressure acting on the surface here, the pressures are both the same. If you go down in the water to this depth here, then the pressure acting on the black substance would be equal to this amount here. And that would be acting upwards. If you go inside the container that you have, the pressure acting at this base would be this amount here. And that would be acting vertically downwards. And so since there's a mismatch in the, these forces, the buoyant force pushing upwards is larger than the other force pushing downwards, which is due to the, the weight that's in the, the container, then this would go upwards. It dries like a balloon. And so this is what happens in the air as well. The balloon has a lower density inside it. <clears throat> so in other words, in the air, not alcohol, but the density of the air in the balloon, I guess it should be the density of the balloon, of the air in the balloon. Let's call it heli mm, yeah, balloon. And the density of the air, so long as we use this expression here, If we want the density in the balloon to be lower than the air density, we can do a number of things. We can reduce the pressure in the balloon. Can't really do that very well, because if you reduce the pressure in the balloon, it'll just collapse. Or we can increase the temperature to make it less dense. Or we can change the gas to helium to make it less dense, which is what this term represents. So those are the options we have in a balloon to do it. In a submarine, because the density of water is large, 1,000 kilograms cubic meter versus air, one kilogram cubic meter, we can afford to make the structure of the submarine rigid enough that it can resist being compressed. You can't do that for a, a lighter than air airship, right, for obvious reasons, okay? So that was a longer introduction maybe than I wanted to give, um, but that's fine. So at least it gets us all on the same page. Um, so. Bottom line, those are the, the expressions that we need. If we go horizontally in a fluid, we know the pressure doesn't change. If we go vertically in a fluid, pressure changes according to dp dz equal to minus the unit weight. It's different in a liquid, which is incompressible, versus a fluid. Uh, in, a, in a liquid, we can use constant density, and we end up with a simple equation. In a, uh, in a gas, so, sorry, I, I meant to say gas, uh, it, the density is not constant, and we have to use an expression like this, which was derived uh, before. Um, this particular expression 
assumes that the temperature is constant, that the expansion is uh, isothermal. There's no temperature change as you go up. Uh, but of course, as you do go up in the atmosphere, the temperature does change. If you're ever sitting in a plane and you look at, you're lucky enough to have something in the back of the seat that gives you a map and your altitude and the temperature outside, you'll know that when you go up to 35,000 feet, then the temperature goes down to something like minus, minus 60. And so in, in centigrade. So at sea level, temperatures are something like, well, on this standard temperature variation would be 15 degrees centigrade. <clears throat> at 10 kilometers or 10,000 feet, or 10,000 meters, sorry, not feet, then the temperature is no longer 15 degrees centigrade, but minus 60. So the difference between these, or the combined difference, is uh, minus 75 degrees centigrade. And that changes over uh, 10,000 meters, which is 10 to the 4 meters. So that gives you something like um, what's that? Zero point zero zero seven five. Oh, lost. Zero point zero zero seven five uh, degrees centigrade per meter. And so, if you then don't take the temperature as being constant, but being as a function of elevation then you can merely, when you have your integration, not only do you not take the density out of the equation, but you also leave the temperature as a variable within the integration. And you have to represent this temperature by some expression, which is just this. Ambient temperature at sea level minus the rate of change of temperature with elevation times the actual elevation. So this value of beta would actually be this, this term here. It turns out that it doesn't make much difference. Um, I'm not sure if this will work. Let's see if it does. Um, oh, let's see, how do I do this? Do I change it? So this is just um, okay. I'm not sure whether when I make it large on my screen. Oh yeah, it does get large on there. So you see, this is just a plot of those two figures uh, for looking at the change in pressure with elevation when it's a function of temperature and when it's not a function of temperature. So if you can see this, the red line is when it's a function of temperature, and the blue line is when it's, we assume it's isothermal as you go up in the atmosphere. So it's a graph that's kind of tipped on its side. So this is elevation on the bottom axis. So this is at sea level. This is at 10,000 meters. Uh, this is the pressure. So the pressure at sea level is something like 100,000 um, pascals, 100 kPa. And as you go up to 10 kilometers, you see that um, the pressure changes to roughly 20% of that, 20, 20 kPa. So that's why if you lose a window in a plane, it's not, not a good news. But what you do see is that the temperature doesn't seem to make much difference between these. Maybe it changes it by a few percent. But the overall very large change in pressure as you go up in the atmosphere is merely due to the fact that you have less air above you as you go up. And of course, if you wanted to, uh, you could calculate exactly how much air, how many molecules of air are on the planet, right? We know that we're sitting at uh, 100 kPa. We can calculate exactly from that what the mass of air above us is. And if you integrate that on the surface of the Earth, you have the mass of air that's above you. And if you know the mass of air, you can convert that into the number of um, molecules that might be present in the atmosphere. Okay. So anyway, so we can do that. So let's go back to, I, maybe I didn't. Uh, let's, go. Okay. let's go back to the things that we didn't say that we we're going to talk about today. So that's kind of the background of where we are. So now we at least. Uh, understand the expressions that and how to use them. The other thing that we'd like to be able to do is to use manometry to measure pressures in our system. Measure pressures in pipes to look at flow rates, measure 
fluid pressures in vertical columns to know um, what the pressure is at depth for a submarine, measure pressures in the atmosphere as well to look at atmospheric effects. And manometry is one of the ways by which we might want to do that. Do this. And it relies basically on the expression for pressure changes in a liquid. And uh, if I look uh, for this, I will play this and shut up for a moment. Or maybe I won't play it. So, oh yes, I will. So I'll, I'll keep the, the, the sound off because I'm plugged into RGB rather than HDMI today, so uh, it won't play. Um, so the idea of a mercury bar barometer is just exactly this, a tube in which you fill with a fluid a liquid, and that liquid, uh, there are some advantages if it has both a very high density and also a very low vapor pressure. And so a typical fluid for that is uh, mercury. And the idea is you put your finger over the end so you completely fill the tube, and then you turn, invert the tube, and put the base into a dish of mercury. And so the self-weight of the mercury pulls down from the top of the tube, and it cavitates, it vaporizes the material at the top because the pressure drops down because you're stretching that flu fluid in the top. That fluid in the top becomes, instead of a liquid, a gas. It's the vapor at the interface between the liquid mercury below it and the vapor above it. And if we know what the vapor pressure of that fluid is that sits at the top, then we can use that to figure out exactly, in an absolute sense, what the pressure is due to atmospheric pressure that, for instance, we're seeing here. And so it doesn't matter on the shape of the tube. Uh, it can be of, um, a straight tube, or it can be one with kinks in it. It's much easier to make a straight tube. And so that's the background of a, a mercury barometer. I'll turn that off. I don't think I need that again. And revisit this here. So the idea behind this is basically that we can use manometry to be able to define the pressure uh, that's in the atmosphere as a result of this. And it uses, um, where are the rules? I'm looking for the manometer rules. Let's see them. There they are. So very simple rules. They're, they're written in shorthand on the first page. But as you go down in the fluid, you uh, add to the pressure. So when you go down, you add to the pressure. When you go up in a fluid, you subtract from the pressure. You can do your calculations either in gauge pressure or in absolute pressure, but you have to be consistent with it. Um, in a closed vessel, as we'll deal with now, the only pressure in the fluid is the vapor pressure of that particular fluid, which will be mercury. And when you go up and down in a gas, then because the density of a gas is very much less than the density of uh, a liquid, then we basically say that the density of the gas is equal to zero, or approximately to zero. So really, there's only four, four rules here. If you go up, you subtract pressures. If you go down, you add pressures. If you have a closed container with, with a, a vaporized fluid, then the pressure in that fluid is the vapor pressure. And if you go up and down in a gas, then you can neglect the density of the gas. These um, rules, if you like, are stated in shorthand here, so-called manometer rules. Go up, you, you subtract pressures. Go down, you add pressures. Um, go horizontally, the pressures are, are the same. If it's evacuated, then the vapor pressure acts. 
And if you use a gas, uh, because the densities are typically so low compared to liquids, then you can ne neglect them. So, so we'll revisit those many times. But the first deal is to be able to use it with uh, the manometer equation for a barometer, in this particular case. <coughs> and so what we can do is we can work from a given location to uh, end up at a second location. So we can calculate... What we'd like to do is we'd like to calculate what atmospheric pressure is. Assume we don't know what it is. So we can start at this point, and we can write that P vapor, which is this point, and if we go down, um, we should add pressure. So P vapor plus the height of the vapor times the vapor pressure. No, sorry, that's not right. The height of vapor times the density of the mercury as a vapor gets us to this point here. And if we go down to this point here, uh, we add the density of mercury, not vapor, multiplied by H, has to equal to the atmospheric pressure. So if we go back to our rules and say what we've, we know about this system, then we could immediately say that this is a very small number. So let's get rid of it. Then we don't have to deal with it. And then if we do that, let's assume that the vapor pressure is also uh, small. And so we could also, well, we don't know this, but let's assume, no, actually we don't need to do that. And so what we have, not quite yet. So what we have now then is the fact that the height of the mercury multiplied by the density of mercury has to equal to P atmospheric. If we put this to zero, let's just do that because it's easy. And if that's the case, then we end up being able to calculate the magnitude of the atmospheric pressure merely as the height rise that occurs within this con container. And so if we measure the value of this height, if we know the density of mercury, then we can calculate exactly what this is. Um, the reason that we use mercury is for two reasons. One is that the vapor pressure is very, very low. It's much less than atmospheric pressure. And the other reason is that the density is, uh, is high. And so you don't need a very high column. Clearly, the height of the column is going to be proportional to the density of the fluid. And so I guess in this case, you could work out for that. We know that <clears throat> atmospheric pressure, so the height in this particular case, is going to be the atmospheric pressure divided by the density of mercury. Atmospheric pressure is uh, 101 times 10 to the 3 newtons per meter squared. Right? That's 100 kPa. And the density of mercury is something like 13,000 kilograms And I, of course, you should have corrected me the fact that this is dimensionally inconsistent because it doesn't have gravity in there. Times 10 meters a second squared. So this, if you work out what this um, ratio is, it's something like 13 times 10 to, 130 times 10 to the 3 divided, it's 101 
times 10 to the 3 divided by something like 130 times 10 to the 3. You can work out that the units match. This is in kilograms per meter cubed. So these are the units that are used here. And if you work this out, it's something like 0 0.77 meters. So 0.77 meters of mercury gives you the equivalent uh, pressure at the base for zero pressure at the top equal to atmospheric pressure. If you wanted to use water to do the same measurement, you can, of course, but you'd need, since water is only 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter, you'd need something 13 times taller, something like 20, 25 feet or so. Uh, yeah, so something no, actually taller than that. So you need something that's roughly 13 times taller than the, the mercury column. And so we can use that to be able to evaluate the pressure. So we've done it where we assume that we know atmospheric pressure and we've calculated what the height would be. Of course, if you really did the experiment, you would know the vapor pressure, put it equal to zero, you'd measure the height, and you'd independently calculate what the atmospheric pressure is, which would be the, the reason for barometer. And so we can use those same manometer rules to work through fluids to be able to calculate uh, pressures at any point. So you could use it in a well, going down in the, the, the subsurface, or a piezometer, as they're called, to measure pressures in wells. And so if you wanted to calculate uh, the pressure at a particular location, you just start at the location where you know it. So this would be P0. We're going to add um, a pressure which is equal to H1 times the unit weight of fluid uh, gamma water. And that is going to be equal to PA just by working from this thing. Uh, we've added because we're going down in depth, so we add pressures. And so now, if we want to calculate what this is, if we set this to be atmospheric pressure, which is zero, if we know what this height is, if we know what the unit weight of water is, and we know that that's 9.81 kilonewtons per meter cubed, just the product of 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter times acceleration due to gravity, then we can calculate exactly what the pressure is at this particular location. If we want to do it by skipping across, I won't move that, I see people writing it down. Likewise, we can do it to be able to calculate the pressure within a pipe. So these aren't little spheres, these are pipes going into the page. Uh, you can use a manometer with a gauge fluid, which is this dark fluid here, which is usually almost always a liquid, not a gas with a gauge fluid in it to be able to calculate the pressure in the pipe. And you always work from the location where you know it. And so this would be, we want to calculate the pressure at, say, P1. And so we'd work from the place where we know it. So P4 would be where we have atmospheric pressure, plus the height change H2 times the unit weight of the gauge fluid, which I guess is 2, right? That gets us to this point here. We know that we can go horizontally across a fluid to this point here because we know that dpdx equals 0, right? As you go horizontally, there's no pressure change on the same plane. That gets us to this point here. And now then we go up minus H1 times the unit weight of fluid 1 is equal to P1. And that gives us. So this is the one that we want to know. If we know this height and this height from the system, and if we know the unit weights of the two fluids, and we know that this is atmospheric, and so if we're doing it in relative to gauge pressures, then this is equal to zero gauge, or 101 kPa um, absolute. Then depending on what we choose for this reference fluid, 
this pressure here will either be in gauge fluid pressure, gauge pressure, or absolute pressure. And so it just allows us to work our way through a system to be able to determine that. And so the expressions that we have uh, are quite powerful in being able to work our way through systems. Um, I think next time what we'll do is we'll spend most of the, the period just doing some examples. And so we have lots of time to be able to look at many of these. But they all rely on the fact that we can use these very simple expressions. DPDZ is equal to minus unit weight of fluid. As you go horizontally, there's no pressure change and the other four manometer rules. Okay. 